Well, we have a rather unusual subject this morning, and the one that I don't believe we've ever discussed, and it has a bearing upon many subjects that remain comparatively mysterious. Long, long ago, in the beginning of our Western civilization, there existed a guild, an organization, that was called the Dionysian Artificers, the builders of the temples of Dionysus. Dionysus being the savior god of that time and those people. The Dionysian artificers had control of the building of sacred art edifices, temples, shrines, and monuments. They were a closed organization dedicated to a very definite proposition, namely that every art and science has an innate morality. Everything that exists in life can be used for good or bad. It can be exalted or it can be destroyed. And the Dionysiacs were the ones who wanted to make the building of sacred houses the most glorious art in all the world. And uh, to a large degree they succeeded. They declared that buildings were divisible into five groupings, each being a type of building for a special purpose, and that the buildings had to be according to those purposes. You could not just make one type of building and make all houses like it. Every type of building had its own purpose and its own reason for existence. Each one of them had a vibratory pattern in the great sphere of causations. I think uh, probably one of the interesting things, years ago when I was in New York, uh, I heard about Enrico Caruso, who had had some in, uh, friends in with a little social gathering. And in the midst of the gathering, uh, Caruso picked up a water glass, empty, and he held it in front of his face a, f a couple of feet away and started to sing. And he sang a certain note and the glass was smashed. It fell into chips in his hands. In other words, he discovered the key to the vibratory rate of the glass, and by the emphasis upon it, destroyed the glass. The same thing is told of Pythagoras of Samos, the great Greek philosopher of the 5th and 6th century BC. He was also aware of the mysterious magic or power of buildings, structures, forms, and organizations of materials. When he walked down the street of one of the great Italian cities, Pythagoras spoke the keynote of each of the public buildings. Each one had a different keynote, and he said that if he had emphasized those keynotes sufficiently, the building would have fallen. Now this was part of the secrets of the Dionysiacs. They believed that all forms of art, all forms of knowledge, had vibratory patterns. These vibratory patterns, when fulfilled, enabled progress in all fields. If these patterns were injured, were destroyed, or frustrated by misuse, then whole systems of knowledge died because of this mistaken emphasis. And after a time, things changed, of course, and the Dionysiacs disappeared into the mystery of ancient times. And in their place came something else, the Roman Collegia. The Roman Collegia was the great body of artisans that were gathered together under the banner of Vitruvius, the father of modern architecture, one of the greatest architects of all times. The great work of, of Vitruvius on architecture is in, in print and the addition of Cesarano in the closing years of the 15th century shows definitely that uh, the entire theory of the Roman architects was based upon the human body. All of the art di diagrams, mathematical proportions and systems that were used indicated that every important public building was in some way a miniature of the functioning life of the human being. These types of thought and so forth had very little 
your support in popular thinking, but the Romans themselves were very fond of their architect and uh, treated him with rare uh, distinction. In the course of time, the Vitruvian architects also disappeared, and in their place came the Comacene builders, located on the islands of Lake Como. They had their last great stronghold as a secret society dedicated to the service of mankind through the ennobling of architecture, making it more wonderful, more beautiful, more functional, and in all cases, protecting its morality. Now, we don't think of buildings as being moral or unmoral. We may think of them being used for various purposes, but that the vibratory rates of the buildings themselves it should change according to the skill of the builders is something no one has ever, ever can much thought to, particularly in the modern world. Well, after the fall of the Comocene masters, the mysteries of architecture came finally to the building guilds of Europe. And there we had the cathedral builders. We had those various artisans that came from all over to produce something that was wonderful and important. When it happened that the emperor of some state or the cardinal of some diocese wanted a temple, a church, or a palace, the word was sent out. And of course there were no newspapers, nothing of that kind in those days. So the wandering minstrels carried the news. They were really quite a little group in themselves. The troubadours, so-called, the singers of sweet songs for neurotic ladies, were also the best uh, reporters and conveyors of information of their time. And they carried around Europe the fact that this particular prelate or prince wanted to build a palace or a church. And in a short time, the builders began to gather for the project. Some of them came a thousand miles to become part of this project. And when they uh, gathered together and got their fair uh, stardom of the building, they elected a representative to communicate with the owners who wished the building to be done and get started on the project. They would not live in the uh, towns near where the, or where the churches were to be built. They chose an outlying place by themselves and they built a temporary town there, a town which they ungoverned and gave no allegiance to the rulers of the state or of the church. They would do the work, but they would live in privacy. And as the uh, time went on and more and more gathered, some of these traveling uh, uh, workers, these skillful laborers, uh, came a thousand miles or more to join this project. And finally, when it was all ready and ready to go, the whole group got together and elected a grand master of the labors, who was to be the one who organized and ruled this temporary city as long as the building would require. This might be quite a time, because in some cases, these buildings require two and three hundred years to complete. As long as they were given their proper dues, as long as they were given the proper rights and privileges, they would work on the buildings. In the moment anything went wrong, or the princes or the prelates did not keep their word, this mysterious village disappeared and nothing could ever bring it together again. These were the masters of the various guilds and uh, they incidentally were part of a great system of guilds. Uh, in his opera, The Meister Singers of Nuremberg, Richard Wagner presents Hans Sachs as a worker in the guilds. It's sometimes said that this opera is a comic opera, but it isn't. It's a very serious one. For it's the story of the builders and the realization that the builders had that they couldn't build what they wanted to build. Whatever was necessary had to be built according to the inner law of the structure itself. Uses could not take a structure for a temple, change it a little bit, and make a palace out of it. Or you couldn't take a, lamp, a palace, change it over, and make a condominium out of it. <laughs> These things had their proper laws. And if you broke the laws, you broke the morality of architecture. Architecture was a great science with a moral structure. 
And this moral structure had nothing to do with the communities where it functioned. This moral structure was not in any way indebted to the kings and emperors and prelates of the time. This structure was inherent in the laws of building, in the mathematics of structure. It was something that you had to do right or it would never be a, a credit to the organization. The building of these houses was a sacred labor, even though the houses may be intended or might be intended for secular purposes. But the uh, builders kept on as long as they received their proper dues. And it was in this time and in this way that what we call the social security came into existence. While they were laboring upon these buildings, uh, the uh, Comocene masters and the guilds builders were all given proper financial assistance. Uh, their families were taken care of. Their children were educated. Everything had to be done in a lawful manner. And if any failure occurred, this mysterious city vanished away and never came back again. The masters of the Comocenes and the, finally of the guildsmen came also to be associated with the great arts of decorating sacred buildings, uh, wonderful paintings, tapestries, all forms of ornaments, and various uh, articles and utensils associated with religion. All these things were done by these masters, and when they were finished, they were paid in full and went away, and that was the end of the transaction. So there was moving about Europe for many centuries, a group of separate people who had their own way of life, and these finally descended into the secret societies of the medieval and early modern world, and we find them actually coming up in the mystical, alchemical societies and all kinds of groups that came into existence to, be, to carry forward the morality of architecture. Now, we don't think much of the morality of architecture. We don't even pay much attention to, to what we are building. We assume that if we get a good plan and somebody wants to build hotels, that if he wishes to build 50 hotels in 50 parts of the world, use the same plan. It looks very nice. It looks exactly like a bank, and all of these buildings look like each other. And uh, you go from here to Bangkok or something, and you arrive in Bangkok, and it looks like you're back home again, because the hotel is exactly the same as the one here. Now, the Comocenes and the master builders had nothing in common with that. They didn't believe in that type of structure. They considered a building like that to be dead because every building to be alive had to have a reason and it had to be a good reason and it had to be a particular reason and it had to be dedicated to a right use and it had to be preserved in right use or it gradually lost all of its meaning and lost all of its strength and all of its wisdom. So when we had in the architectural field these people who were constantly building according to a law, a law within themselves. It meant that everything that was built had some life meaning in itself. The ancients believed that buildings were alive just as much as people. They were not alive in the same way, but the vibratory rates due to the mathematics of the patterns gave them a mathematical soul, a reality, an eternity that could be defended or, de or destroyed by corruption. That all these buildings, when they were finished, had to have right usage. Any building that was built to uh, injure or corrupt or to exploit was not regarded as acceptable by these master architects. And for a long time they did preserve the wonders of the, and beauties of this wonderful trade. And we find much reference to this in the stories of the building of Solomon's temple and all the various legends that have to do with the grail and with the, the Meister singers of Germany. So we have this type of thing. We have what we might term a moral architecture. A moral architecture means that a building is consecrated to its purpose. The purpose must be right or the building should not be built. If the purpose was to buy it, to build something cheap and sell it expensive, no. The great builders would have no part in it. Everything had to be honest, ethical, moral, and true. Not only in people, but in the works of people. 
from the things they did and the structures they created and the business organizations they built if these different groups were not basically honorable something was happening and we know now pretty well what was happening there was a gradual disintegration of the entire moral fabric of society it was very important that these builders should keep the faith and uh, in that also they had some very interesting symbolism now in the early days the uh, Greeks had several orders of deities and the highest of course were the celestial deities and the least were the deities of, of the forests and the glens and the meadows but uh, when the Greeks created a temple to Zeus who was the father of the gods and supreme supreme regent of heaven not the creator of it but the regent of it they always left an opening in the top of the building so it's kind of a circular opening to the sky because after all they could not build a likeness of heaven but they could allow themselves to worship to lift up their faces and behold heaven from the temple so the temple with an, with an opening in the top became a proper symbol for the highest effort of man which was finally simply to become aware of the presence of heaven later on when one reason or another changes were made and this opening was closed partly due to climate and weather conditions and so on and a dome was placed over it a dome that would represent the exaltation of heaven and therefore all these different palaces that have different rooms and patterns of various kinds were all built for a purpose and these unions of builders didn't die no one knows what exactly happened to them but they had what they call the builders marks they are marks cut in the stone that the builders trued or completed or put in place these marks are the marks of the builders the master builders and each builder had his own mark and kept it for himself for his entire life it's interesting therefore to know that when you enter the library of congress in washington dc you will see a set of steps going up on up around the front of the building inside and some of the stones have the builders marks that were put on them whoever put those stones in knew the story of the building knew the story of what it all represented for too that it was a dedication a building dedicated to service if it had been dedicated to profit or to exploitation or been built to sell for twice its cost there would have been no marks on the stones they would not have been considered to be worthy of such inclusion so we have one morality the morality of building according to the law to use it as it should be used to create what should be created and to preserve the secrets of great architecture for great works of architecture and these different structures bear witness to the mysterious descent of a kind of initiated craftsman who belonged to a secret order that serves all kinds of purposes and also this same secret order in Protestant Germany over 300 years ago while structuring this also introduced uh, the workman's compensation and uh, uh, various benefits for the sick and protection for the children the widows and the fatherless and all the different benefits that we now think belong to modern labor unions they were all worked in in those days because they were part of a great plan these architects were a part of a citizenship above nations because they served the one good in all things and good is no matter of nations good is a matter of personal integrities and the collective living of the principles of true building and true architecture and because building has become the symbol of progress because it has become part of a proof of progress it is assumed that every building that is built must be built honorably and must be built for a, an honorable purpose that it must fulfill its honorable purpose 
and that the building's type of structure should be consistent with the purpose for which it is intended. If these laws are kept, the building will stand for a long, long time. Now we know, that, of course, that the cathedral builders belong to these groups and were initiated into them by the sacred rites which came originally from the pagan world. But where these initiatives gained their in, uh, improvements uh, came to control the use of various elements of structure, they also had a moral obligation to recognize the significance of right usage. And they also had to, have to realize that the moral usage of any object or any science or any uh, uh, building was developed around the basis of its right use. The moment a building was perverted, something happened. It became sick. And the unmoral building is presumed to finally die. The moment truth is taken out of the structure, the moment the principles are prostituted in any way, the future of that building is destined to decay. And we find some very interesting things in connection with World War II and, for that matter, World War I also. Most of the great cathedrals of Europe were bombed in the First or Second World War. They were hit many, many times by bombs and shells, but comparatively few of them were ever actually destroyed. And among the uh, various buildings that were bombed out in the First World War, nearly all of them were in perfect condition again for the Second World War. And those that were bombed out in that, you can go today and you will find nearly all of them rebuilt and in good condition. Something happens as long as the purpose for them was right. If these buildings had been corrupted, had been sold into secular purpose, the chances are they would never have been rebuilt. But there's something about the integrity in the building itself that accomplishes its perpetuation. So this becomes one of the beliefs of the ancients concerning morality. Morality is the right use of things. The right use of things is worship. To believe a thing and serve it honorably it may be a secular thing, but still the act is one of worship. It is one of perpetuating the good, serving the right, and believing in the true. These things were the parts of the labors of the great builders of antiquity. Now, as we are going along again, we find out that other sciences also have their integrities. And we can take art, for example. Art was a very sacred thing in antiquities. Art was held in part of religion. The uh, temples were ornamented with magnificent sculpturing and with various symbols of the divine beings that were supposed to God over them. There's one thing we have to gradually understand, however, and that is that the ancients did not worship stone and wood. They worshipped they something that these elements symbolized. They did not worship the gods of, kind of stone. They merely recognized them as the symbols of that which was important and significant in life. Now, in the uh, development of religious art, we find it's coming into a flowering later than architecture. Uh, we know the Greeks had a certain amount of painting and religious art. So did the Egyptians. But in both cases, the symbolism was rather crude in our thinking. The florid art that, came, that rose in medieval Christianity uh, was a great step forward in the paintings and carvings and artwork of Western civilization. Here we had the great artists Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Guirini, Van Dyck, many, many, Dura, all these very famous artists. Most of them were very famous for their religious work, and they created an artistry that supplied the temples and churches and palaces with appropriate emblems of divinity and human reality. Everywhere we turned, art was being used to tell the great story of man's salvation. In those days, art was therefore completely moral. It was moral in the sense that it was dedicated to a purpose. 
It was dedicated to a duty, a responsibility. It was demanded of art that it should set an example of that which was noble and beautiful. And most of all, the artists themselves must know the beauty and sublimity of great order in art and in structure. We know that the great painters were most of them devoted to religious subjects through the Middle Ages. But even when they went into secular subjects, there was a quality about them. The great painting tells a story. It reveals a mystery of some kind. It touches into the inner life of someone. Great art is therefore one of the noblest of human achievements. And great art is considered as a morality. Whether it is a secular subject or not, great art is moral because it impels individuals to a nobler reaction to the problems of daily life. It may give more aspiration. It gives more strength of devotion. It helps to make the individual feel something of the responsibility of his own conduct. And so we have a, a canon in art. And this canon apparently was built into the concept of art. For art from the beginning had to have meaning. And the art of mean, meaning of art was only one thing, to help. Art had to tell the story of human growth. It had to reveal the integrities of life. It had to inspire the individual to rise above the smallness of his own conceits. It made it necessary for him to become aware of his place in a great world of spiritual integrities. These integrities were captured in the paintings and sculpturings of great art, artists and artisans. And in the Middle Ages, all artists were called artisans because they were really workers in elements to produce a sublime consequence. And everywhere we go, in Europe especially, we find great art and we admire it and we wonder at it. And we know that great art is art keeping its own morality. Because if art extends into something that is not moral, then art ceases to be art. It becomes corrupted. It is like a human being who, starting out nobly in life, becomes involved in corruption and finally becomes dissolute and no longer uh, properly is a citizen of society. So art, as in its original meaning, helped. Therefore, this was the morality of art, that it was true that it was right, that it expressed the convictions of honorable persons. It might change. Art in different parts of the world has many different meanings. But in old art, an art that is uh, inspired, all art in those ways and in those forms can be considered as beautiful. Beautiful because it conveys a message. And this message is one of hope, one of security, one of sharing in a divine splendor, one of learning to grow and to appreciate the sacrifices of others. So art in these terms became a great part of our world knowledge. Now comes something else. What is happening? All of a sudden, the integrity of art was threatened. Why was it threatened? Well, there have been many people trying to explain this mystery. But I think probably... The real answer lies in the fact that the great desire was that the artist could create a new market, not, in not involved in integrities, but simply in design. A market, a market suitable to be sold anytime, anywhere. And as time went on, uh, this modern trend gradually dissolved and destroyed practically all of the integrities of art. Art became merely something to exploit. It became something to uh, try to sell some exorbitant prices. Profit became the principal um, consideration. The artist was looking for a chance to make some money off what he did. The artist, as a guildsman of eternity, disappeared. In his place came a good businessman who also had an agent who was a still better businessman. And the problem of with preserving the integrities of art slowly faded out. If you watch modern art, you may say it is interesting. You may say it is extraordinary. You may also say that it is rather confused. And also still further, that it's unpleasant. 
and you are told that it's unpleasant because life is unpleasant. And that is considered an excuse. The world was unpleasant also back in the days when art was great and tried to cast a light upon this unpleasantness. Now the tendency is to join in the unpleasantness. So we find art gradually losing its morality, losing its integrity. And in a time when it's very necessary for the world to have all the inspiration it can have, there isn't much inspiration to be one of the greatest fields that we know, the field of art. We can go through the galleries and so forth of many different artists and discern, discern the, the achievements of these people. We also now gradually divide art into two classes, fine art and also then folk art or non-classical art. Art that originates in the barracks and in the balconies and suburbs of Paris. But this kind of art is not what we used to call art. We find the constant continuation of scenes that are, that are basically not equitable, not noble, not beautiful, but are supposed to be true to life, and that makes them eternal. But unfortunately, this isn't true, because an eternal mistake is impossible. Eternal realities may be right, but a mistake can never be eternal. It must someday be faced and corrected. And the tendency that we have today in art is to glorify the mediocre. This is appealing not only to the artist who is looking for a fast penny, but it is appealing to the buyer who is having little taste themselves, uh, deeply influenced by the reputation of some master of the modern schools. Little by little, we find art going down into commercialization, going down into modernization. And if we're not careful before we get through with it, it might probably will be computerized. <laughs> we will have everything from Michelangelo to Leonardo da Vinci on little discs that can be produced on short notice. <laughs> All of this is a little hard, however, on the ethics of art. Art is no longer a source of ethical support because no longer do we find the development of nobility to be depicted in art. No longer do we find the tremendous need recognized for beauty. Actually, every home in the world ought to have at least one fine piece of art. This is not necessarily a very expensive one. And if it has to be, it can be a reproduction. But it can be a reproduction of a great and good piece. Instead of all the hackneyed uh, mediocrity that sells for all kinds of prices. Every person of, under, of culture must realize that art is part of normalcy, part of morality, part of ethics. And the individual who realizes that in nature there is a sublime grandeur that the human being tries to capture in a great work of art. Though these things are important, it's important to see through to the other side where the depths of things are uh, available to our consideration. In the medieval period, in early modern period, there arose in Japan a very important group of artists. They were mostly monks, uh, probably following the Zen persuasion. Seshu was one, a, an artist who developed a great work of art with a single stroke because he believed that one straight stroke of truth was more important than an elaborate many-colored painting of error. And that in some way, truth was simple. Truth was the perfection of something. And these artists spent a lifetime making uh, examples of very perfect depiction of the written characters of the language. They would make one little character, beautiful, tri triumphant work of penmanship or brushmanship, and that would be framed and hung on the wall because it was a symbol of truth, a symbol of reality, a symbol of the individual rising above the mediocrity of the everyday to rest a little while in the beauty and, and, and traditional elegance of the great artist period. The uh, religious art of Asia is much of it very, very significant. And as, be, as it is art primarily 
there is no, no reason why it should be rejected. But it represents in many cases a continuation of the simple need of the individual for beauty. Now if we look around our civilization today, it is not especially beautiful. We see the old streets disappearing and everything taking their places is made up of, of boxes of concrete and steel. We do not see very many individuals who are kindly disposed towards each other in a genuine way. We do not see people who are patient of each other. We do not see parents who take care of their children properly. We do not see all of the things we've heard about. And one of the reasons we don't see them is because they have disappeared from the ideal spheres of our art. They have disappeared from the books, they disappeared from the journals, they've even disappeared very definitely from television and motion pictures. We see instead of art, instead of the effort to be beautiful, the whole theory is now based upon being more or less violent, uh, to be something that attracts simply because it is so miserable, so destructive and so immoral that no one seems to be able to turn it off. This is what is happening. And now, the great ministry of art, the, one of the saving graces, that is important to us as the creators and redeemers of the past, has gone into an almost complete oblivion. We do have occasionally something, but for the most part, we have sacrificed all the great art because the cheap art sells better. There again is a morality disturbance. There again is a sign of things that are sick. And as long as this sickness goes on, we will be breaking the law of art. Because art itself is beautiful. It is just as beautiful as a virtuous person. It is as virtuous as a sunset or a sunrise or life on a great mountain. Art is beautiful and it is moral. It is moral in a divine sense that it represents and presents to us the ultimate moralities of universal existence. Everything about true art helps to inspire. And as the individual gradually locks out inspiration and becomes more and more bitterly involved in the commonplace, in fact, he has no longer any room to consider things above and beyond the, his immediate appetites. While this is going on, we find civilization gradually slipping into the doldrums of decadence and decay. We find all kinds of things we have not paid much attention to contributing to the miseries that we face. We are taking away one by one the beauties which gave courage to the past, which gave the individual a certain incentive. We have to be given away the religious incentive. We have given away the philosophical incentive which the modern world never had. We are actually giving away the best of science, which is far more deep and idealistic than we suspect or the scientists themselves suspect. There are great things everywhere, but we are gradually destroying them in favor of a strange, sad mediocrity. And we call this mediocrity a kind of morality, the only morality that we are able to accept because it is the only morality that does not demand anything from us except the price of the picture. These things we have to remember very carefully. But there is a music. There is the music of the spheres, as Pythagoras called it. There is the great music of Bach and Beethoven. There is great music in our hearts and souls. There is great music in the little rhymes and folklores of the past. But everything depends not upon sophistication, but upon integrity and sincerity. And there has always been a good music, but it is now fading away. And only a few very strong and dedicated artists are able to carry on the tradition. And day by day they become fewer and fewer. Because the world is no longer interested in normalcy. It is interested in the excitement of the abnormal and the subnormal. Now while we're at it, we take another view of art, which indicates again that we are dealing not with a dead thing, but with a living principle, and that is music. Music today is a very 
strange and a little sad department of the arts. Music today has lost most of the value that it had. Folk music still has considerable integrity because no one has thought about growing it. It is something that has been handed down with nostalgia from the past. But modern music is becoming more and more difficult. It is mostly noise. Physicians, educators, psychiatrists, and those studying social problems realize that hard rock and music of so-called of this kind is definitely socially detrimental. And that is the depths to which Bach and Beethoven have fallen. The great music of the past was a sacred music, not necessarily a hymn, but a music of great emotional and uh, tonic, tonic sin sincerity. It was real. It was beautiful. You could sit quietly and listen to it, and a, great, a mood of peace came over you. It was a, a kind of music that you knew had in it an inspiration. Now, not anymore. So we find these people in trouble, their children in trouble. The cases are known where actually uh, hard rock and, this, and similar types of things have resulted in definite emotional diseases in small children. We know definitely that they are helping to lower the standards of human life. Now, music was not created to destroy life. It was not created to be distorted and deformed and depraved. So what happens? When we misuse music, we break this rhythm which binds it to integrity. When we go against the laws and the integrity and morality of music, music becomes a deadly enemy. No matter what we dispose of, whatever we use wrong, whatever we abuse, turns upon us. And long ago, the ancients came to the conclusion that it's necessary to realize that this universe is based upon a tremendous integrity. That the various uh, principles and laws and concepts that we have cherish now were based upon a great basic integrity, a morality of infinites and of ultimates. And that various desires, various ma masses of, uh, in, of data are all gathered together in a great pattern of divine purpose. We are here to fulfill by bringing forth the good. We are not here to fulfill by destroying everything that has helped to build the world of the past. Our revolt against the past is more or less foolish because actually if the past was good, it lives. If it wasn't good, it dies. But those parts of the past which have to do with the arts which have to do with the techniques of human improvement and dedication will go on because they are part of this morality of the infinite. And it is this morality that Pythagoras became aware of. He realized that every part of knowledge has laws governed by mathematics and governed by precise rules and laws. He was the one who created the first diatonic scale. He was the first to give us the law of octaves in music. And he knew definitely that he was not working simply with a series of natural accidents. He was not working with something that didn't exist until man discovered it. He worked with something that had always been, that was part of universal integrity, was that all things in their substance and essence are right, and that their right use is the perfection of themselves and the civilizations that be, be built upon them. Everywhere we turn, the corruption of integrities is the part of the great danger we face. It is part of the mistakes which we are making every day. We look about us and we find now that uh, the number of religious organizations are, in dist are disturbed because they do not know how much of uh, human uh, shortcomings can be condoned and how much has to be condemned. Now this is a very t touching thing. Because if the church will not condone the conduct of an individual who wishes to live his own life, he will simply walk out of the church. He is not going to change to match religion. And the moment the religion begins to pick on the, on the immoralities, this, this, the congregation diminishes. 
we've got to come to the point apparently where we must accept evil as good or the church cannot continue to function now all of this is very foolish but it is part of the kind of world we live in a world in which the great integrities of morality have been forgotten now we go through all these different branches we see the things and the mistakes we made personally become the basis of the sorrows and problems that we have to face so we go back to the idea of a universal morality a universal morality that has nothing to do with what we believe in anything but which condemns that which is untrue we are finding more and more that our various strategies and, and spoils are unsuccessful we are facing into a very grave difficulty we are looking forward to a new century we, we realize that the children who are being born now will inherit the world 25, 35 years from now and what are we doing to help them what are we doing to prepare these young people for the jobs that they have actually in the old days for instance uh, we had no public schools at all and of course much was made of the classical world there wasn't any schools well this isn't quite true there was a school in the ancient world but it wasn't the kind we have today it wasn't a case where you send all the children and they all get the same lesson the school of the ancients was the tutor the guide the guardian persons of importance or of reasonable means had their children edu educated by scholars the principal profession of the philosopher was the education of the young and as a result of that the education was according to what the teacher thought the child could do and the child could do much more under the encouragement of an enlightened teacher than he could over a disinterested school board actually therefore someone said to one of these philosophers why should I send my son to you why should he be educated in philosophy and the philosopher said well probably the best answer to that is if I educate your son and he goes to the Olympic Games and sits on a marble bench it will not be one stone sitting on another <laughs> this is a genuine example of 2,000 year old humor and there was much of it we find constantly the idea in ancient times that education was a ability to bring the young into the presence of the wise of any age or any of whatever age it was Plato had his school Aristotle had his school in a cinder track Pythagoras had his school in Crotona and Socrates had his school in the nearest forest where he could sit and discuss with his disciples the great things of life so well, in ancient times there were teachers but they were teaching not the common knowledge that uh, could almost be inherited from the marketplace but that type of knowledge which truly created a better person the great purpose of ancient education was to bring enlightenment to the soul of the student to make the student aware of the great rules of life rules which he might never know unless they were brought to his attention he was taught to recognize the thousands of symptoms and symbols that come to him every day of what is happening in society and from these to learn what is right and what is wrong and that which proves itself to be wrong can never be right even though a majority of people believe in it everything is always based upon the right or method of life the law as it is really in nature and in the universe so we are now looking for a new century to come along and we are a little disillusioned with the situation as it is in fact some are more than a little but the tendency is to recognize something is wrong we have always known that something was wrong but now it looks as though almost everything is wrong and we're becoming a little worried a little uh, fatigued at the pressures of uncertainty we've got to sometime face into the very simple fact that we will be wrong as long 
as we build our way of life in a universe that has a proper way of its own. We cannot change the universe. We cannot change immutable law. We can destroy ourselves trying. And we can break down institutions, or we can crucify the teachers that come to us, but the universal law remains unchanged. There is no way that the individual can make a good life out of bad conduct. There is no way in which we can do the wrong thing long enough, and enthusiastically enough, to escape the negative consequences. So that we've got to prepare something that is a little better than we've known before. And most of the things we are trying to learn, we can learn from examples of things that have, have happened and have been known to be worthy of consideration. In the 17th century in Europe, uh, Comenius, a Moravian minister, uh, in his own name, Kominsky, but with Latinized into Comenius, was the teacher of, the, of Europe. Hartlib and many famous names were associated with him at that time. And he was part of a group of moderns striving to break through the collapsing philosophy of medievalism. So Comenius was a school teacher and a preacher. As a school teacher, however, he had a very simple philosophy, one which uh, to a degree contributed to the feelings and beliefs later of Madame Montessori. But uh, Comenius said very simply that the individual's character is set for life before he enters grammar school. He has learned what he can learn. He will know what is right and wrong. He will understand truth and error before he goes to school because he must study first at the most important school of all, the school at his mother's knee. She is the one who has to give him the morality with which he interprets everything else in life later. She is the one who must point out to him what is important, what is real, what real love is, what friendship is, what sacrifice may be. She will have to learn and teach him the value of a simple faith in the essential integrities of existence. By the time that she has brought him up to the, the entry into a school, he knows good and evil. He knows right and wrong. He knows love and hate. He also sees around him the results of misuse and abuse. He is gradually a coming part of a decadent civilization. But there's one difference. He is coming to it with an internal realization of the facts. He is coming into it aware of the fact that he's entering something that is wrong and that it is his duty to not be part of that which is wrong and if possible to work to bring back that which he learned from his mother's knee. That all things begin with the simple dedication of life to service, life to integrities, life to kindness and that these things are taught much more than merely alphabets and words and mathematical sums. It is all right to learn to add and subtract and multiply only after you have learned to exist as an intelligent, dedicated person. So little by little, as we go into the new generation, there is much to point out that we must do all that we can to restore the university of the mother's knee. We've got to help to bring back again the integrities that the child must learn before it can be exposed to the corruptions of its time. If these changes are not accomplished, we will have serious difficulties. When I was quite young, my admirable grandmother thought I should have some, you know, masculine supervision, all that sort of thing. So I was sent for one term to a military academy. And it was a good one. It was one of the highest, and those who graduated from this military academy could hope or look forward to a possibility at West Point or Annapolis. But before I was hardly in the place, the first night I was there, my baggage was burglarized. It was burglarized by the students. Now, they didn't get anything important, but they got something that was very important to me because I liked it. I was even then a stamp collector. 
and I had a pretty good collection for a boy. And the night the, the, the collection disappeared. I reported it to the head of the school, and he said it's too bad, but those things happen. And by the time I had been there for three months, I found that the young boys there, most of them be there because they were incorrigible. Mostly there because they came from broken homes. Mostly there because their, if their parents were rich and wanted no bother with them. And these kids were, not, were as bad, if not worse, than the vagrants of today. Morally, ethically, dishonest, by the time they were 12 years old. Now this is the thing we have to do something about. And this is the reason why we cannot accept without question the idea that we're going to drift into security. We are not. We are going to have to build it. And those in the younger generation need help. And they need help before they go to school. And they need help in the idea of a type of education that tells them the facts of integrity. Because without those, all education is dangerous. An individual who believes that he can become successful without being morally and ethically correct is going to face a very sad and tragic career, which is going to end as it is ending for thousands every week in misery and death. So nature is not going to change. Nature just wants things to be right. Nature has beautiful meadows filled with flowers. And each of those flowers is a moral entity. Each flower belongs to a certain species, and nature has made sure that the thousands and millions of different species of living things on this planet are all properly cared for. Nothing is neglected. The only destruction comes from man. So these things have to gradually change and improve and grow until we get somewhere. But unless we want to have a really serious problem, we must realize that there is no way of correcting it by jailing the adults. There is no way of correcting it by continuing to punish the, the um, wrongdoer. The thing that has to be done is we have to start the children off right. We cannot make them do things which will be difficult for them. You take an adult and take his profit away from him because of ethics, he is going to keep his, eth his profit and lose his ethics. He is going to turn against a society that deprives him of things he wants. But if from a child, small childhood, he starts growing up realizing the values of life, he will then gradually improve a little. Three, gener three generations of such improvement would probably correct about 50% of our troubles. But no one seems to want started, because to start it you have to go against somebody who is locked in his own selfishness. So we have to realize that nature looks at it very simply. We are here to learn. This must be considered a fact. Either we are here for learn or we are here for no reason whatsoever. We certainly were not created merely to be disillusioned. We are here for a reason. And that reason apparently is to grow. And actually our embodiment in this world is a kind of school embodiment in itself. We are supposed to learn how to live and to come out of this world at the end better off in wisdom and understanding than when we came in. We are supposed to realize gradually that crime does not pay, that delinquency is not a successful career, that all the things we are supposed to be doing are held together by a band and bond of universal integrities. We are here to grow, we are here to champion honesty and integrity, and we are here to set a foundation for a coming generation that is going to need a lot of help. We are here because we must move into the future. And already we have hazarded most of our resources. We are now developing constant agitation and worry over problems which should never have existed in the first place. But they do exist and they will continue to exist as long as individuals are indefinite in their allegiance to ethics. Actually, we have to recognize something, and we have to recognize it whether we like it or not. The universe is a moral entity. It may not be personal. It may not be individual, but it is moral. Everything that is good, it supports. Everything that is wrong, it finally destroys. 
there is no such a thing as nature supporting error. Nature is constantly disillusioning people who have errors. It is also punishing those who won't give up their errors. But the basis of the whole thing is that there is a plan. It is bigger than anything human beings can devise. It was a plan great enough to bring us here for reasons we do not understand. It is big enough to take care of us while we are here if we use it intelligently. It is here to give us some hope about an unknown future if we wish hope. It is here because it alone is the lawmaker. We, are, exist, we exist only to obey. And to obey the law means integrity, means honesty. It means rightness of conduct. It means taking care of the duties of daily living with integrity and dedication. If we will do these things correctly, the world will straighten out. We will get rid of these wars fought daily for people who can never keep anything they win and people who will never get back what they never owned. These things will all smooth out if we can make an integrity out of our pattern of living. An integrity for us is to keep the world as clean as we can and wherever corruption comes in to use integrity to correct the corruption and wherever ignorance takes over try to find what the wisdom of it is all these things are possible the Greek philosophers have told us beyond question that in nature itself in the great structure of things we find the final laws of right and wrong right and wrong are according to our code very uncertain and very mysterious and unrealistic. But right and wrong in term of nature is very clear. Right and wrong is that good shall survive. Right and wrong consists of realizing that we accept or reject the Ten Commandments. These things are bigger than we are. And no one has ever been able to prove we can break them. We try to break them and they break us. Therefore, with the coming to the end of another century, it's time to do something to prepare for a better way of life than we have ever known. It is our duty to pass on the lamp, to, make, to do that which is necessary, to prepare young people to take over a world which they will have to rule a few years from now. And we cannot take over a world of narcotic addicts, uh, in a world of de degenerates, a world of corruptions and expect civilization to survive and if civilization doesn't survive it will not be because it, reality is angry at us it simply just takes the attitude and in itself we keep the rules and live break the rules and perish and these rules we have never made we will never amend them we will never correct them we will never to go against them and succeed because these rules are life itself. They originate in the eternal wisdom that brought the worlds, the suns, and the moons, and the stars in, into manifestation. They are all part of one great and magnificent structure. And they are all part of an immutable system of laws. And these laws, if we keep them, will make us the happiest generation the world has ever known. If we break them, we will go down with the miseries of the past. So it's very definite and very difficult to think about it. But if we're all grown up, then we have something else to think about. We have to realize that somewhere inside of us, as grown-ups, is the little child. We are all children. We are offended, we cry. When we're slighted, we are angry. When we are hurt, we are disillusioned. Most people are still children. And that is, in a sense, wonderful. Because if they're children, they can learn. If they've grown up and still don't know, it's going to be very hard to teach them. But 90% of humanity is still made up of children, regardless of their age. And children can learn. And children can hope. And ch children can learn from those who teach them. And children can learn from the experiences of the day. All people want to be happy. They want to have a good marriage and a good home and happy children. They don't want one divorce after another. But we are trying to build a civilization catering to the weaknesses of ourselves and it is falling apart. What we have got to do is build a civilization of which we realize that the strength of that civilization rests in laws that we cannot break. 
laws that are immutable, but were created for the purpose of bringing us to the perfection and integrity that is necessary to build upon ourselves another century. And this next century could well be the beginning of the golden age. It all depends on whether we decide to obey the rules or try to make other rules that no one can obey. Whether we will work to keep the truth bright and shining in our books and in our music and in our art. Or whether we insist on going on with little penny dreadfuls that mean nothing and accomplish nothing. So it's up to the individual of today <coughs> who considers themselves thoughtful to work as much as they can on themselves. If they have a friend, uh, understand. If they have an enemy, make a friend. If they have hopes, build those hopes. If they have fears, find in wisdom the remedy of all fear. And if they are alone, find that no one is alone in this universe, which is full of the love and wisdom of one eternal parent. With these little corrections in mind, we can do a great deal to make a better world. Thank you.